Okay. Uh, hi, morning. Um, so, no, I don't think so. Sort of interest, right? Uh, our class on Friday, how many of us were following through? How many of us managed to follow through with what we were doing? Okay. One out of God knows how many people. Those of us that weren't following, I mean, what's, what's the problem exactly? Hey, okay. Uh, so I thought I would start off with some, a, a few announcements here. I mean, the usual, we have a class, I mean, we have a test on the 23rd, which is Friday. It's at 7, make sure you show up on time. Come prepared, please. Uh, the venue is ARE, although we'll split ourselves into two groups. There's the one group will have to go somewhere else. We can't write the test in that small venue. Um, too much cheating. Um, and then, again, I just want to emphasize, you want to make sure that you're checking your grades on Moodle, right? If there's a problem, you want to make sure it is fixed. Right? We've written quiz, num quiz one all the way up to 14 at this point in time. Make sure that the score that is on your script matches with what is on Moodle, because once, is, once your grade, your CA is compiled, it's going to take into account the things that you're seeing in or on the Moodle, right, in your Moodle gradebook. So make sure this, um, this is actually correct. Um, and if you have an issue with the way you are graded, you know the drill, right? Query session, Friday 9 to 13, come and see us, we shall fix the problem. Uh, so also, I, th I, thought, I, th I thought I'd talk a little bit more about uh, this d data compression thing. I don't know if people have noticed this, but the Moodle currently has a, a limitation, right? So you cannot upload files that are above eight megabytes in size. Um, and I think you remember there was a time when, when I said I couldn't upload the slides on Moodle because you know, the, it, I think the size had grown beyond eight <coughs> megabytes, so I instead hosted it um, on our course web page. Um, but I thought I would ask, right, why do you think we have a limit here? In Moodle, why do we have a limit of, why would, why, why would people decide to say we're going to limit the upload size of files to just eight megabytes? Okay, so you don't want to talk. Uh, sorry? Yeah, they, they tell us then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so think of it from the perspective of, uh, like we know, right? Uh, I don't know how many courses are administered using the Moodle, but in an ideal case, if all the courses at UNSA were administered using the Moodle, and if everybody was submitting assignments using Moodle, you notice that the amount of space required would be substantially larger, right? Think of your class um, alone as an example here, ICT 1110. Uh, your, typical, your typical size for uh, so as an example, quiz number 12 alone just occupied a total of about 36 megabytes, right? But this is, this is, assignment is highly unusual. It's like a one pager, right? Just one page, you know? But, but there, there are certain courses where you have maybe 500 students, right? you are required to write some essay that's maybe 10 pages long, for instance, right? So you notice this is, I guess, one of the reasons why size is, um, is an important thing to take into account here. I just thought I would, I would mention that. Uh, and so something else I thought I would, I would kind of mention here is um, the fact that when faced with the challenge, we now know that there's a couple of options, right? So in my case, Slide number 17, too large, in fact, not 17, 18 itself. Too large to fit into Moodle, why? Because the total size is 11 megabytes, right? Both the one-up slides and the four-up slides, 11 megabytes. I can't upload them to Moodle, so what do I do? Option number one is I can apply lossy compression, JPEG compression, on the PDF document itself, right? So manipulate it in such a way that the size reduces substantially. 
Option number two, I can apply lossless compression by just zipping the PDF document, which is what I did here. Right, so applying lossy compression on one up slides and two up slides result in, uh, so the one up slide, I've been, the size has been reduced from 11 megabytes to 4.2 megabytes. Right, and then the, the four up slides, um, the size has been reduced to one megabyte. And then I can upload them to Moodle, which is, I have uploaded them to Moodle actually this way. Um, but you notice that uh, applying lossless compression doesn't really help me in any way. Sure, I'm, I'm able to reduce the size from 11 megabytes to 8 megabytes, 11 megabytes to 4, uh, I mean 8.5 to 8.4 megabytes, but still, I cannot upload these files to Moodle. Why? Because <laughs> Moodle has a limit of 8 megabytes. This is more than 8 megabytes. So the only viable option for me is just uh, lossy compression. And if you're interested in finding out what the difference is, really, you notice here that I decided to take screen grab of the original um, original slide, one of the pages, I think this is slide number nine. You notice that the original, so the, the slide that has been compressed, right, you just use GoScript here to compress it. Um, you notice that if you look at this image, this is not very clear now, is it? Yeah. Because it turns out that the application I was using, GoScript, um, actually compresses the images in the document, in the PDF document. So you notice the slides that are on Moodle, 18 specifically, you notice that the images are a bit faded. Um, if you want to see what, and some, some of them won't really be clear, right? You can't really see the name of this file, for instance. So if you want to access a high resolution file, you go to the course web page. I just thought I would mention that, you know, lossy, this is lossless compression, and where you get to use these things, uh, why they're important and whatnot. Okay, so, so, so this is the thing, we started our discussion, you know, talking about abstraction and whatnot. <sighs> why, why are we learning how to write assembly language programs? What, we just show up to class just because they're max, right? <laughs> why? <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, but that's not an, yes, you can use it. <laughs> Don't understand. You don't even have to ask. Why are we learning? Why, why are we doing this, right? Remember, fundamentally, we said uh, what we're interested in doing is we're trying to understand how a computer works, right? I want to take you guys back to our discussion of um, computer software, specifically these things we call the uh, language translators, right? We we said that. Uh, I mean, these these. Software packages that we work with, Chrome, Ocular, I don't know who plays Fortnite in here, but Fortnite, whatever, I don't know if that's the spelling. There's nothing special about these application packages, right? A bunch of people just sat, sat down and decided to say they were going to write these packages, right? And what they do, we learned a while back, is they write a series of source code, right? So the, each, each of these different applications that we use have associated source code or instructions that spell out exactly how the piece of software is going to function. And we, we actually gain an, gain an appreciation for why the vast majority of the so-called application packages are actually written in high-level programming languages, right? Like Java, Python, Perl, JavaScript, right? The eternal programming languages out there. But something else we discussed was that the computer does not understand, because the way a piece of software works, obviously the source code has to be translated into a form that a ma machine understands, right? A machine does not understand high-level uh, language code. So you need to dumb it down to a format that the machine is going to understand. And we, actually learned that there's software that can be used to do that conversion for us. Interpreters, compilers, decompilers, assemblers, disassemblers, right? Um, right, so as an example, I mean a language like C has an associated compiler. Some compilers will convert the source code in, in C, right, that's C, direct into machine code. Some of them will convert um, the source code into assembly code and then you can complete assembly code into um, equivalent machine code. So we are, we, are, we are interested in 
we're interested in learning how these assembly language um, instructions are formatted because it's, it's the only viable option we have. For us to better understand what a computer does, for us to better understand what a computer does, we would have to study what a stream of bits such as this is all about, right? what this means. But this is hard, right? Because it is hard, we need to abstract this by, by taking into account or by looking at the level that is slightly above what the machine understands. Assembly language instructions. Right? Uh, so, voila. So something like this um, has equivalent assembly code that is this, right? And you notice that this is a lot easier. It's, I mean, you look at add i, you know, draw sign t0, draw sign 0, and the number here, and you, you know that, you know already that uh, at least this makes a lot more sense than this stream of zeros. I really doesn't matter. I know you probably sit there and argue and say, yeah, but if we are told what sort of uh, format this, um, what sort of format is being used, uh, we would know. Yeah, sure. I mean, and it turns out that MIPS actually uses a, a fixed instruction format, which we discovered is one word long, right? So each of these different instructions, right? The five, the five instructions we have here are each 32 bits in size, right? One word, four bytes. But still, I mean, it really, it, it really, it really wouldn't matter even if you were to separate these streams of zeros into, uh, I guess, bits of 32. It would still be hard, right? So do we now understand why we're doing this? We are setting the stage for when we start looking at the data path, right, so that we see exactly how the machine gets to process these streams of ones and zeros. Easy, right? Uh, I, I thought I would also mention here, uh, so each of these instructions, right, this, this because we're saying each, each instruction, each complete MIPS instruction is 32 bits in size, and true to that, this 32, one, 32 bits here are equivalent to this. The next stream of 32 is equivalent to this instruction. Yeah, how cool is that? The next stream, 32, right? Next stream, 32, or four bytes if you want to. Uh, and then finally you're done, yeah? Is this, is this fine? No. Okay. And then so something else we, we, we had a, we had a, we had a, we actually walked through how, uh, I mean, I guess this is pretty intuitive, but we, we actually walked through this simulator we're going to be using, right? We said QT spin, there's something special about QT spin. Well, QT spin is, it's an application software, right? But it's, it's a special type of application software. It's, it acts as a simulator. It simulates a computer system that is based on the MIPS architecture. Right, so working with QT spin is synonymous to you using a computer that is built using the MIPS instruction set architecture. So the things we'll be doing with QT spin are synonymous to the things that you typically do on a computer system. The instructions will be running will be running within Qt spin, not on the computer where Qt spin is installed. Do you understand this? Right, similar to the way VirtualBox works. Right, so we are using Qt spin so that we, we kind of uh, understand these, these MIPS instructions. And, and, and really we are using Qt spin, not our machines, because Qt spin, I mean, because Qt spin is in the implementation of MIPS, and MIPS is a, um, a risk-based architecture, so we have, um, a few instructions that would need to study for us to understand exactly how a machine gets to operate using these instructions. Okay, and then, I mean, walking through this piece, piece of uh, software, I mean, so we wasted time looking at this. We know this, right? Yeah, we know this already. This is easy stuff, thanks a lot. But so something else uh, uh, we discussed last time after we walked through, you know, the the, this piece of software here is this notion of how we go about um, writing assembly language programs. So we, we, we will write, you know, so you write your, your assembly language programs, 
you have to execute them somehow, right? In this case, you have to execute them using the simulator. But what we're saying is that the way we execute the programs that we've created is we need to load, you obviously create the programs uh, using a separate piece of software, um, text editor. Uh, once you're done with that, for you to execute your program, you must load um, that uh, source code, right, somehow. So you use QTSPIM to do that by just going to file, and then you load your program, right, and then you execute it. But something else we mentioned was that um, we must ensure that our program is syntactically correct, right? We must ensure that it conforms to the syntax that is specific to the MIPS instruction set, down to the dot, right? So you, ju you just don't wake up and say you're going to write uh, MIPS assembly language instructions. You have to follow the rules, there are conventions, right? Uh, conventions with regards uh, to how the different instructions that you have access to are supposed to be used, right? All the 200 plus instructions that are there. Um, right. uh, fortunately, when you when you when you do write uh, a program that has errors, obviously your uh, QTSP won't be able to execute. It will signal to you that there's something wrong with your um, with your source code, and then you just all you have to do is just make changes to it so that you correct whatever errors are associated with with um, with your source code. All right, and then finally we started. We started our discussion of of how exactly we go about writing these um, assembly language programs. Right, um, we mentioned that we ideally need to write. So this is a sample program here. We we write them using a text editor, which is a separate piece of application software. Right. So it could be Notepad, it could be Notepad++, it could be Kate in my case. Um, as long as it's a text editor, right? Do not use Microsoft Word to write these programs. Because it turns out that uh, word processor typically, um, I guess, slot in special characters in, in, in the output, right? So once you save that file, there are special characters embedded somewhere there. So you want to make sure you use a text editor, plain, a text editor like Notepad, Wordpad, uh, or Notepad++, right? Um, so you, you write your, your source code like so. I mean, obviously we'll go through the convention of how this works. Um, um, and then once you do that, obviously you save your piece of your, your, your source code and then you load it using QTSPIM, right? And then we, we also began discussing some of the elements that you typically find in your um, MIPS assembly language program source code, right? We started off with comments. Uh, we said that the importance of comments is that they help you describe what the instructions you are writing are all about. And the reason you want to do that is because number one, you might decide to refer to the program that you write at some future point in time. In all likelihood, you'll have forgotten what exactly it is you are doing, and so the comments will help remind you why or what, what specific bits of the programs um, are all about, right? Number two, it's usually the case that when you write these programs, you share them with other people, and so the, the easiest way for people to gain an understanding of what it is you are doing is if you associate comments to your source code or your programs. And we said that comments are really specified by just using a pound or a hash sign. So anything that follows the hash sign, entire text that follows the hash sign is a comment. So line number one is a comment, right? Because you have a hash. Where does the comment start? In line number one, if you're saying line number one is a comment because we're saying a pound or a hash sign signals that everything that follows is a, is a comment. So in line number one, what, what is the comment? Yes, thank you very much. The comment is hash space program to add two plus three. Because we're not saying two hash, we're saying anything that follows the hash. So the additional hash is the comment. 
Uh, so line number six is a different type of comment, which is nothing more than an inline comment, right? So this is a valid instruction which will be executed by the assembler once you assemble this program, but anything, everything that follows this pound sign won't be executed. Is this fine? Yes. What's the Sorry? The hash or the pound sign is a comment. It won't be executed. Because it's a comment. It's like uh, everything that, f the comments won't be converted to machine code, that's what we're saying. The stuff that is converted to machine code are the instructions. This is a comment. It has nothing to do with, uh, the computer doesn't, it doesn't care about this, right? The machine doesn't care about this. So the stuff that will be converted to equivalent machine code is line number two, line number three, line number five. Blank, a blank line is irrelevant, right? Mm. Yeah. It's for you. It's for you and everybody else, anyone else who's going to read your code. It's, it's like when you, when you are writing, let's say when I print out the, when you print, when we print out the slides, if you do print out the slides, you know how you, you, you have a highlighter and whatnot. The, the, the highlighter has nothing, what you're highlighting has nothing to do with the content now, does it? It's for you to remind yourself, oh, I, I highlighted this because it's, it's meant to remind me that this is an important thing I need to look up or something, right? That's what comments do, right? They serve the purpose of trying to describe what the program is all about or what specific portions of the program are all about. And it works just fine. You can remove this, line number one, line number 10, remove it, remove everything after it, it works just fine. It will work just as well as it works with the comments. Which is why I was saying uh, the computer doesn't care about this. This is cutest thing. What about in line number two? No, sorry? It is an instruction, these are directives, which is what we are coming to. Again, so the, these are actually more to do with the rules I'm talking about, right? So there are specific rules that we have to follow. Uh, hey, also I wanted to mention up front here that um, we, are not, we are not doing this so that we learn how to write assembly language programs. Nobody does this anymore. We are doing this so that we understand the discussion of the data path, right? If we just jumped right straight into discussing, oh, this is a data path, this is what happens, it would be hard for us to understand. But we need to at least gain an appreciation of how the different types of instructions work. And in fact, out of the 200 plus instructions, we'll probably sample out maybe less than 10 of them. Those would be sufficient. And of the 10, at least, they'll, they'll be distributed evenly between the three different, um, or amongst the three different instruction formats, MIPS instruction formats. Right, so this is a directive, it's just a directive. It's, a, it's part of the rules, right? Um, <clears throat> it just tells, um, it tells uh, the assembler to say everything that follows after text is actually the source code itself. Right. Um, so, uh, so it's part of the rules, like I said. Um, they are not converted into machine code, of course. They just tell the assembler what to do. Um, so in the case of the uh, text directive, dot text, notice the convention, dot text, not just text, dot text. Um, it, it specifies that uh, the instructions, the assembly language uh, source, source code is actually in plain text, right? And then the globe. What? No, there's no such thing. Uh, yeah, but, okay, those are, those, are, that's just, those are the rules, right? It's, yeah, there's no dot number. That's, that would be nice though, but uh, <coughs> there's no dot number. <laughs> um, are, we, are we following? This is nice, right? This is, this is really nice, and it turns out, by the way, right, and, and I'm trying so hard here to link to some of this, to try and, because most of the, what we're talking about is abstract, I'm trying so very hard to link these things to some of the things we've already discussed. Like with Edward, I'm sure we've discussed the OSM model, right? Um, on how, how information 
when, you, when, you're sending a text, when you're sending a text via WhatsApp, what happens to that text? How is it transmitted to the other side? It turns out that uh, you have a uh, physical layer. So when I'm sending it, that email from my, my computer or my phone, if I'm using my, my phone, the first thing that happens is the application I'm using is going to interpret that text, and then that text is going to be broken down all the way up to a point in time when it's going to be converted into ones and zeros, right? I told you this, right? And I do hope he's explained exactly how these things are packaged into what they call network packets and then transmitted onto the network, but that's besides the point. But it turns out that what we're discussing here, the concept is similar to what happens to data as, be, as it is being transmitted on the network. It first of all needs to be broken down into ones and zeros. Why? Because these ones and zeros can easily be converted into signals. On the other side, when you, you receive that thing, the signals will be reconverted back to this form and then you go up a hierarchy where you get to access the information using the piece of application that you're using. So it's, it's the same thing. It turns out that when you understand what we're doing, it'll be so much easier for you to understand anything to do with computers, actually, right? Which is why we're doing this anyway. This is nice. If he, if he hasn't, I, I don't know if EDU 1020 has to do with this, but if he hasn't, there's a course called, uh, is it data, net, data, data communication and computer networks or something, where the fundamentals of what happens are actually going to be discussed. Yes? I'm about signal. So what's the difference between data and signal? It's the same thing. I mean, a signal is composed of data. It's just that the form in which it's being transmitted. What is data? Raw facts, right? So, so, so when I'm speaking, I mean, you can, you can say my voice is data, right? I mean, yeah? It's just that it's in a different format than it would be if it's interpreted by the computer. This is uh, so nice, right? Um, right, so something else that's a part of, uh, is, is this making sense? Uh, please, as, as, I, as we discuss some of these things, everything we are doing is connected. Make sure you, you try as much as possible to connect what you're learning from these different, especially the more, um, the courses that are related to each other. Uh, so EDU 1020, ICT 1110, uh, Oh, I don't know what else, but that's all, that's all. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah, but yeah, uh, that as well. And then next year when you start doing 10, 20, 2010, right? Everything is connected. Okay, and then you have um, blank lines as well. Typically, I mean, yes. Yeah, we'll get to that. This is just a, again, it's part of the convention. You are telling the, um, you would be telling QTSPIM here to say. You are, you are interested in using a register. It's just, a, it's like in this case, we're saying register number eight, register number nine. This is register zero. The special, regist the special purpose register, we said that is always set to zero, right? Register zero, which is also, which is also, you remember this, right? Which is also, yes, you do. Which is also, you remember this? Yeah? So the, hmm? Yeah, we, we, we had a quick walk through the different registers that we have access. We said we said we said we are restricting our, our discussion to just integer registers, right? Um, but so we had a walk through of um, of these things here. The thirty one the thirty one general purpose registers, they are broken down into ranges, right? You remember this? They're broken down into ranges, and so you notice that, that dollar sign eight falls within uh, what is that? It has to be a term, not here. Uh, no. So it, it falls under here. Right, and it turns out that the, the, the way these registers work actually is, is that um, they have mnemonics, right? So names, like is, re, is it remember names that you can use? Uh, so you can choose to use either dollar sign zero or dollar sign the actual zero, Do, dollar sign eight or dollar sign T zero, temporary register zero, right? Dollar sign 15 is temporary register seven, right? Yeah, don't worry, this will make sense once we, we, work, we start working through some of these. Uh, is, that, is that fine? Okay. 
All right, so the, the door sign is just, it just means we are accessing a variable which is just a register value in that case. And again, uh, don't go out there and tell you people, we are learning how to write programs using this. You don't, you don't write programs using this, right? Because it would be time consuming, right? In fact, you don't write anything useful using, using assembly language code, and unless if you're a really good programmer. Uh, but <laughs> around people saying, uh, the person who's teaching you doesn't know what he's doing, why would you teach, teach you how to write programs using assembly language programs? Um, so, so, so this is the thing. So there are also blank lines, right? And, and blank lines are there to, you typically have blank lines in your program so that, so that your code is easy to read. Um, and so they are ignored by the assembler, right? They're just, they're just there to, it's, it's like when you're writing, you just don't write one block of text. You have paragraphs and spaces and whatnot so that the person who's going to read what you're writing can easily follow through with what you're doing, right? So the same goes for assembly language programs. Um, sometimes you might leave out spaces so that you, you separate uh, different sections of your source code so that it's easy for you to follow. And the reason why you want it to be e easy to follow is because you typically wouldn't write 10 lines of code, right? This could be like 100 or 50 lines. Right, so for you to make sense out of what's happening in the 50 lines, you want to break it up into sections or represent it into different sections. But the key thing here is that the blank lines, right, are just going to be ignored by the assembly. Okay. Um, and then the main directive here is just... Uh, yes, sir. I'm not doing anything with the blank lines. Why don't you just Sorry, why? What's the between the blank lines? So that the, your code is easy to, to read. So, so if, if I wrote this, right, I could have written this without blank lines, but if I, if I wrote this with everything just uh, stitched together, it would be hard for you to follow. And, and really, I mean, this is like just 10 lines I know, right? If I showed you an example of something that was like 100 lines long, it would be difficult for you to follow through with what was happening, which is why you use like uh, blanks to just separate things, important sections. So, sections that are logically related to each other, so like variable declarations, for instance, um, things of that nature. Okay, so I'll use the main just to provide or specify the symbolic address um, in memory, and, and, and really this is where execution of the program would typically start from, essentially. It's like a label of sorts. This will come up a lot uh, once we just briefly look at loops. The syntax is, uh, when you're specifying labels, the syntax is you specify the label followed by the full colon, like that. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking here. Right, so, and then, uh, so line number six in this case, I mean, it, this is, these are the... This is about line number nine. Right? Oh, it's just a label. So the, it's a label here, but it's a special type of label because um, it signals to the assembler where execution of this, um, of this particular program is going to start from. So when the assembler sees this, it knows that it's going to start execution here going down. Right, uh, I didn't work. Good question. Um, Right, so just example of specific instructions. At this point in time, we've actually started using the actual MIPS instructions, like, so there's this add instruction, for instance. Well, it says all add instructions. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're just saying, um, no. What we're doing here is we're just saying, um, what we're doing, I'll correct this, what we're doing here is we're just using the uh, MIPS add instruction. So we are, we are telling the assembler to say, when you see this line, just um, add, because this is always zero, we are saying uh, add two and zero, and then put the result in the register eight, or register T zero, right? And then in line number seven, we're telling the assembler to say, or the machine to say, Add three and zero and put the result into register nine. Uh, I thought you said uh, those uh, dollars and 
number. Yes. What do you mean I'm adding registers and a number? Where is that? Yeah, but I just said, we just said this is the zero register is a special purpose register which is always set to zero. It's always going to be zero. It's hardwired to be zero. No, so so this is we'll, we'll look at this instru this instruction in great. This is one of the these are one some some of the example instructions we're going to look at. Add I and add. The way add works is by well the way the way it's implemented in the MIPS ISA is when you have add I or add I is always followed by a destination register, right? Destination register, which is RD, a destination register followed by source register, right? Yeah, or target register, and then followed by an immediate value, like a, a, an actual value, right? It could be an integer in this case, this could be seven. And what this instruction does, by way of, uh, this is how it was implemented. What it does really is it, it, it takes the result of adding what is in this register and the value here, add them up, and then put the result into this destination register. This is how it works, right? Um, this is why I was saying, what we're essentially just doing here is we're t telling, we're, we're, we're just saying add two and zero, because this will always be zero, and then put the result into eight. So the value of, of regis in register eight is going to be, is it going to be two. Right? In this case, again, we're saying add three and zero and then put the result into nine. But add, on the other hand, works different because all the, all the, uh, the things you're working with are all going to be registers in this case. So what you're saying here is um, add what is in register nine and in register eight, and then get the result and store it or put it in register number 10. And you, remember, you, know, you notice here what we're doing is we're playing around with registers. Why? Because they're temporal, uh, memory locations on the CPU ideas. You remember what registers are, right? They're on the CPU, they are supposed to sit on the CPU. The ultra fast memory locations. So it, we can really just uh, swap out things in the registers. Once we use up the value, we can replace it with, with something else without running into problems. Yes, sir? Uh, what's the relation? Uh, seems like the registers uh, the first Six, six is uh, register eight, seven is register nine, then eight is register ten. But is it implementing or? Sorry, I can't, I don't think I'm following. I think, uh, what's the relation with the number of the registers in the first line? Oh, yeah, so they don't. Well, it's just, it's, it's just, I decide to, to when I, when I'm using, when I, it's a personal choice, and usually as a, as a person who writes these sort of programs, you come up with your own way of doing things. When I'm using registers, I prefer to use them incrementally, right, in a certain order, so that I, I don't mess up things. Um, but the, the only key thing here to, I can take away point here is uh, we are working with temporary registers in that range that we spoke about. To be on a safe side, make sure that uh, your program only makes use of uh, temporary registers, not special purpose registers. Remember this thing here? So I'm using, I'm using, I'm using, I, typically what I do, and I advise you to do this, always work with the temporary register range. So it's either this or, or this. But usually, I mean, this, this range will be enough for you. Uh, you have seven registers to work with. This, well, the, the things that we're going to, the toy programs we're going to be working with, in all likelihood you rarely find yourself in a situation where you're working with more than five registers actually. Even three, at the very most it's just three registers you'd be working with. Why? Because you can easily swap out things from uh, the register. This is like done procedure. So if, if again, if you were to go back to I guess if we were to go back to that piece of program, you notice that it's, it's being executed sequentially. So once, once, the, once line number six is executed, the only thing you'd be interested in from line number six is what? 
is the value that is in 8. <coughs> once, once this line is executed, it's kind of bad example, I guess. The only result you'd be interested in is 9. If we had another, let's say, if we had another, if we had another, uh, If we had another, let's say another instruction here, uh, let's say we want to subtract, uh, we want to subtract um, what's in, this is a terrible example here, but I guess it will work. We want to subtract, maybe this should be better. We want to subtract what is in register, we want to get the result of subtracting what's in register 10 and what's in register nine, and then put it in 11, this is what we do. But a smart thing to do is, because you know that what was in eight has already been used and you won't need it again, you can just say, overwrite whatever was in eight and then replace it with the result of that statement. Which is what I was saying, say when you're writing these things, typically you can reuse registers once you've, you've made use of the value that was previously in that particular register. Yeah, which is kind of nice I guess. Is this fine? Yes? Why not just say? Uh, in the register two and three. We, we have a discussion in lecture series number is it 20, where we start looking at the three instruction formats. Again, it's the way that um, the instruction set was implemented. You don't have an instruction that takes in two absolute values. You always work with register. So the simple answer is that there is no instruction that will allow you to add two values, absolute values. You'd have to first of all work with registers. So what you're doing, what we're doing essentially is we're saying we're getting data from memory, putting it in a register, get data from memory, put it in a register, and then work with the values in the register. And this is how the, the CPU actually works. If you remember the fetch decode execute cycle, right? Yeah. Although our, our discussion was just mostly restricted to those special purpose registers. Oh, we are going to get the data and put it in MBR, MAR, and those funny things, right? This is, but these are just general purpose registers that we're working with. Is this fine? Does that answer your question? So we cannot do what you're saying because there is no instruction that would allow us to do that. Can't we? So the best way of thinking about what's happening in the registers is uh, when you start your computer for the first time. When you start it, I mean you're initializing it essentially. There's nothing happening, right? Well, I guess once you load things into memory, there is. But <coughs> so where are you going to find the thing? The things that you're going to load in the register are dependent on what you want to use the computer for. Right? Is this making sense? Um, I was hoping we could get this right before we proceed, but if we, we can't, then we soldier on ahead and just um, hope, hope for the best. <laughs> Need a bit of imagination. This is an this is interesting thing. Again, I'll tell you this, right? I don't think that, that when someone is sitting in front of you and telling you about EDU 10.20, it's not like they know, they know nothing really. But uh, I know nothing, right? But the thing is I understand the basic things to do with computing, which is why I can use any piece of software I want. I can, well, it's not like I can use it right there and then, but it's a lot easier for me to, to figure out what's happening behind the scenes because I understand the fundamentals. And these are the fundamentals, right? And you, you realize that next year, once you start doing that 2010 course, it'll be a lot easier for you to understand if you understand what's going on here. Uh, okay, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, right, so uh, again, to do with MIPS here, are, are you following Mr. Shawa, sir? Um, this is good, right? <laughs> so, um, you notice here that uh, the, the instructions we're working with, at least for now, is um, 
And I'm, I'm saying here all instructions are through operands, but there are certain instructions that might not necessarily have through operands, especially you see this when we start looking at the J format instruction, for instance. Um, but specific to the examples we are looking at here, you notice that the, uh, the destination register is the first operand. Um, and then these are just holding values, right? So what we have here is similar to, these are the instructions you are looking at. Uh, hopefully this will make sense. It's similar to something like this. We are saying C is equal to A plus B. So what, uh, if we were to translate this into equivalent MIPS instruction using the add operation, or, um, the add instruction, then we'd say dollar sign C, comma, dollar sign A, dollar sign B, right? Although we can't say dollar sign C, dollar sign A, and dollar sign B because we have to use the predefined general purpose registers. We said there are 31 of them. So you have to make sure that the registers you're working with are part of that list of registers that we walked through. Yes? Yes, sir. You're saying you have 31 registers. General you purpose registers, yes. Numbers that are more than 31 and you want to store them. Which numbers? Like, give us an example. Or 151. And you want to store uh, each one of those digits. You have what? In one of the registers. 151. Let me start like, from zero to start in register zero. Two in register two. See, the, when, I, when I said you have to think about some of the things we did, I meant it, right? If you remember what's happening on the CPU, execution of instruction is not done. Like, you can't execute, well, maybe 51 instructions at once. You see, when you're executing these instructions, think, think of execution of instructions from the point of view where it's fetch decode cycle, right? One instruction at a time. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily be doing it like, in the way you're describing it, where you have 151 instructions. So that branch of registers? In essence, no. You would never, the way a computer works, you'd never run out of space in the register. <laughs> if, if we have, uh, if you look at these instructions that we have, Using the fetch decode cycle, how, how would, in fact, if we had, let's say you had add instructions, 151 of them, like you are saying, the way you'd be executing those things is you'd be doing them one at a time, right? And in all likelihood, I mean, ask yourself this question. If you had 151 registers, right? I mean, 151 operations you wanted to perform. One, two, three, up to 151. I don't know where you came up with 151 here. In all likelihood, right? By the time you're getting to instruction number five, you would not necessarily need this thing here. Maybe the, the reason you'd have you have the first instruction is you want to get the result of what you, what you get from here and reuse it somewhere down the line here. So at which point, once you use this up, you can reuse whatever register you are using here without a problem. Do you understand this? So can go back to the letter you had. These are temporal storage locations and they're, they're temporal because you, you're, you want them to hold intermediate results. You couldn't possibly have a situation where you have 151 intermediate results. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I couldn't possibly think of a scenario where you'd do that. Is this fine? But I, I like these questions because I think it shows that we are, we are following through with what's happening. This is good. This is good, I assure you. We are following through, which is good stuff. OK, is this fine? Uh, can we now quickly transition to look, looking at the three types of instructions? If there are no questions with regards to what we discussed. MIPS architecture, uh, Qt spim, how we go about loading and executing, be the same one, right? And then elements of uh, <laughs> MIPS assembly language programs. Yeah. Let's ask questions here. It's, we're supposed to be learning here. Don't, why, why don't you ask questions? Yes. What register you want? Can you pick any from one of four? Yes. Yes. Oh, I have it here. You can pick any from uh, from the range that we spoke about. Any. Not your master shop, that's the one. 
No, you can't, you, you can't start from one. You have to work with, I just advised us to make sure that we work with temporal registers. For the most part, the programs that we are writing are going to be storing things temporarily in registers. So you want to make sure that you, you work with registers that have been designated as um, safe to use. Don't touch any of the special purpose registers. In fact, for some of the special purpose registers, if you try to write a program that's going to write to the program counter, DOS and PC, you'll probably run into an error, for instance. If you, if you attempt to say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, to store, uh, I'm going to store, okay, I'm just uh, 10, uh, well, I guess I'll use zero, and then I'll put seven in here. Uh, and then if you, at some stage, you're going to say, oh, I will store, in dollar sign zero, I will store, I will store um, the result of dollar sign 10 and eight. Because what you'd be saying here is, get what is in register 10, which would be like seven here, seven plus zero, right? So get seven and add it to eight and then put it in register zero. But we just say that zero, zero, or zero is, is what? It's a special purpose register that is hardwired to always have a value of zero. And so you're, you're just wasting your time by doing this. Why? Because this will always be zero. So if you expect that this is going to be, oh, seven plus eight, no, right, it won't. It won't be 15. So, which is why I said, to the NSF side, let us just make use of, when we're writing our program, then you notice most of the examples I have in the slides they will almost always exclusively make use of the temporary register range. I rarely, so you can choose to use this, you also have access to this other temporal storage range. But really, I mean, eight to 15. Yes, this is more than enough. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, yes. Since you say uh, zero always be zero there on the register. It's not me, oh, but yeah. Yes, like like in this case, it's just helping us too. And and you notice that uh, there's another instruction that, I'm starting off with instructions that we can easily relate to when you're adding. I know adding is a lot easier. It turns out that um, there's an equivalent instruction that you can use instead of add i, you can just load immediate dollar sign ten seven. This is the same as that. You're doing the same thing different type of instruction. But the reason I'm using this is I'm trying to make sure that we understand what's going on first. So I mean, once we start looking at uh, I format instruction, once you start looking at the different formats, you, you, see, you see that you can actually do things in different ways. You can choose to do that, do this, is one and the same thing. Is this fine? Yes. Seven with the value in register 10, or maybe with 10. No, here. No. Here. Yes. No, you're, you're just loading. What you're saying is you're loading. If effectively, what you'd be saying implicitly is that load the value of 7, which is in memory, into register 10. Just load it into there. Put it there. No, what about the. This? Oh, this you're saying, so it's an add, add immediate, right? So you're saying add, add the immediate value, which is seven, with the value that is in register zero, get that result, and then load it into the destination register 10. But this will always be zero, right? So you're saying get the result of zero plus seven, and then. So can you have a situation of uh, you're trying to add uh, values that are both in registers. Yes. Yes. We, our example has that. There, seven, make it a register. Where? Put your dollar sign in front. In front of where? Seven. Here. Yes. So you, you want us to say add dollar sign 10, dollar sign 0, dollar sign. Seven, yes. No, don't do seven. Let's use the range 8 to 15. So we say maybe okay. nine. You could do that, but you, this will only work if there's already a value in nine. So, but you don't be able to put a value in nine either by saying load immediate nine, put the value, or load into 
9, 0, plus uh, 7 or something. Still doing the same thing. It's just a way of putting things into, because that's what we're doing with a computer, right? Fetch something from memory, and we discuss this. Go to memory, fetch this from memory, do your processing, take it back to memory or store it somewhere, right? Yeah? Yes, madam. So We had what? Oh, sorry, we have a class, but you're welcome to join us. Please, come. We said what? Sorry? There is never a class on a Monday. We are staying in here until we understand this. Well, no, there's no class today, right? I said what? Did I load immediate? Uh huh. Ten. No, that's the thing with registers. This is a temporal storage location. So what you're doing is, whenever you say you're loading it, you're overwriting what is in there. You're going to overwrite what is in there. Good question. Thank you. Do do we understand now? Yes. More questions so that we understand before we uh, proceed. Said, you couldn't have uh, straight numbers. Uh, let's say seven plus seven. You couldn't do that. No. But you can add registers. You're not adding registers. You are, you are adding, you're not adding registers, you're adding the values that are in the registers. So, good question again. If you wanted to accomplish this, find the value of seven. Here's a question for us. Even though we haven't discussed the different instruction formats, but using the things that we've introduced, how would we be able to get the value of 14 here? By writing a series of instructions. Yes? <laughs> How? Let's say load immediate. Okay. And then you say register A, comma seven. And you say add. Add instruction. You say uh, register. Add immediate. Uh -huh. So we have nine. Uh -huh. Then you say eight, seven. Yeah. This, this would work, actually. Yes, but because, because the, so the, the key thing here is to make sure that whenever you're using registers, there has to be a value you're interested in in there. Now here's the, here's the thing for us, how would we be able to, to do this? What was the question? Implicitly, yes. So what we're doing here is we're saying before we can add seven, seven and seven, we first of all have to load these things into registers, right? We, we can't work with them just the way they are. So which is why we're starting by adding, adding the absolute value seven into register eight. We now know that register eight has a seven, and then we'll use the add immediate and say we're going to put the result into register nine. But what result are we putting there? The result of adding what is in eight, which is a seven, and an absolute value of the seven, and then we'll be able to do this. But but let's is this there's a question. Thank you. Now we are thinking, right? This is an elegant way of doing it. I, I guess it's a shorter way of doing it. So what you're saying is, instead we say, there's already eight here, you, nine, right? You, when you say eight, you overwrite what is in eight. So nine and then seven. And then you'd say, yeah, I mean, so 10 and then dollar sign nine, dollar sign eight, right? So it is. But we'll see this, we have a lot of questions, plenty of questions, limitless questions to practice with. Can we transition direct into instruction formats so, so that we understand the three types of instruction formats? <laughs> yeah, but we can, we can proceed, right? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I mean, now, now this is interesting. I've never, I've never encountered students that to say no. <laughs> No, serious, I've, I've worked with other people elsewhere and they're always 
eager to learn, right? I thought you'd be interested in this. Don't you want to know how? Do you? Excuse me. Do you not? Do you not want to know exactly how? How your WhatsApp message when you say hello to someone? How that thing actually gets to go to that other person? Yeah, then you only be able to do that once you learn how to do this, right? Yes. Sorry. Deferred gratification. Okay. Are there questions? Okay. Question time. Yeah, it would be like we're simulating, mem in mem like it's like you fetch something from memory, so yeah. So, in short, we are just telling the registers what to do the instructions. Yes. Make, make no mistake, right? When, not mistake, don't, don't forget some key things here. This thing you, you are calling Chrome, a web browser Chrome, or WhatsApp, the WhatsApp app you have on your phone. You see, when your phone is, when you run this application using your phone, you, you, you use your thumb there to open WhatsApp, right? What, what, what's happening when you're interacting with WhatsApp is the instructions associated with WhatsApp, there's probably like thousands of instructions associated with WhatsApp, right? The instructions associated with WhatsApp are the ones that are going, are being fetched by the CPU from memory, instruction at a time, to be processed. But that, in, that fetching process, when they're being fetched, there's a couple of things happening behind the scenes. It could be that uh, maybe you're call, you calling some instruction that is similar to this, where you're saying, oh, write to this memory location, get this value or something. Do you understand this? What, what a computer does is it just adds things. It's pe performing very basic arithmetic operations and logical operations, that's all, fundamentally at the lowest level. So it doesn't matter whether you have this complicated application that's a game with fancy graphics. Fundamentally, it has individual instructions associated with it that are executed by the CPU so that you see what you see there. And we know what we are seeing there, right? Data, images, video, right? Okay, uh, I'll see you when you see me, which is Wednesday. I was thinking, I don't think this is necessary, but I was thinking we have just a quick, uh, a quick review of what we are doing, especially that uh, we had uh, a, a lot of us who failed to convert D2 base 16 to, no, and I'm being serious here. We just do a, s sorry? <laughs> oh, <laughs> excuse me, sorry? What? Okay, we'll revise this on Wednesday. But we we'll revise this with none. Excuse me. Okay, class is over. But if you want to stick around, and then we'll talk a little bit more about. Excuse <laughs> uh, me. I'm, I'm curious. Why? Why are you? I just said you can leave if you want. To. Why? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with class, it's a great discussion. <laughs> Guys, see you when you see me. Hi. <laughs> Do you want to bring the scripts at some stage, query session, and then we'll fix that? Yeah. <laughs> Again, <laughs> you should speak to her. She's very good at these things. She will tell you how to. <laughs> You're not serious, are you? <laughs> no. Okay.